You're listening to the Utah Checkdown Podcast. And now your hosts, Josh Furlong and Josh Newman. Welcome back to another edition of the Utah Checkdown Podcast. I'm Josh Furlong, joined as always with co-host Josh Newman. Josh, how are we feeling this morning? Feeling all right, a little tired. Uh, got in late last night from Seattle doing some family stuff. So, you know, you know how it is coming off vacation. You're trying to get your bearings and uh, haven't quite gotten there yet, but hopefully at some point today. That's that's great to ha- have you back. Uh, we're excited to, to get back into this full swing. Yes. I, I, I think I promised Josh I wouldn't talk about the Jets, but I can't promise our next guest won't. So He already did. He already did before. <laughs> so no. Uh, but we do want to welcome uh, the, the always incredible John Wilner. He's a writer for the Bay Area News Group. He writes Pac-12 Hotline. I'm sure you've seen that here at KSL.com, as well as any other... Um, platform uh, you know across the Pac-12 footprint he also co-hosts the Kenzano and Wilner podcast so he's a busy man uh, we're lucky to have him today John how are you doing today I am good thanks how are you guys doing doing, doing well. well doing well it's a uh, it's been a wild time in the Pac-12 I think uh, the last I talked to you you were excited to finally have a vacation away from conference realignment but uh, <laughs> it's still gone boy the Pac-2 still exists <laughs> Was that like in 2019 or something? <laughs> yeah. John Wilner hasn't had a vacation in 2019. Give the guy a break. It is. Uh, it's been pretty much nonstop since uh, the Texas Oklahoma news over two years ago. Crazy. That is crazy. I, 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 I told you the last time we talked that it was like, oh, your survival guide was probably just going to be a few times. And it ended up being a, what, 16 month? Uh, oh, my God. Maybe not that long, but. And it's not even, it's not over. That's true. It's not over. Now, now you get to be a courts reporter and and everything. You you've you've uh, built to your built to your repertoire uh, a ton this year. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. I have I have actually spent more time reading court documents lately than I have you know watching watching highlights and interviews and all that kind of thing with actual football. Well, let's talk football because we're done with the conference realignment stuff. We're done with all that nonsense. So. Let's jump into it. We'll preview a little bit of the Pac-12, maybe a little bit of the Utah-UCLA matchup. But um, for you, you know, on Monday you wrote that Utah is doing Utah things right now. What do you mean by that? Well, first of all, they're not getting a whole lot of media attention, which is very typical. And I'm sure Kyle Whittingham's fine with that. You know, the national media has gone other places. You got the two-time defending conference champs that are undefeated. They got two power five wins already. And I think there's only a handful of schools in the whole country that have already have two power five wins. Uh, And they're what are they ranked 10th or 11th? And, you know, under other circumstances, they might be getting a little bit of attention, but there's so much going on in the PAC 12 on and off the field. Obviously the Colorado story, all the Washington, USC, all the undefeated teams, the, the fate of Washington state, Oregon state, so Utah's flying below the radar, and and it's not that's not atypical. And meanwhile, while they're doing that, uh, I th- I thought they kind of went a long way to solving their quarterback question for next year while they were dealing with this year, right? I mean, Nate Johnson looks like he is in you know well positioned to take over next year. Now I'm sure they'll have some kind of quarterback competition in spring ball, but look, they were trying to replace Cam Rising in the short term, and they ended up getting a long-term solution, seems like, which is a very Whittingham thing to do, right? Nobody's paying attention, and here he goes solving a a significant issue. John, as Pac-12 play uh, begins in earnest this weekend, when you look at the whole picture, what are you most looking forward to during this Pac-12 slate? I mean, it's... It's uh, hard to pick one thing, but I do look at the schedule. You know, the conference, when they put the schedule together, they were anticipating that there were going to be, it was going to be a good season and a lot of high profile quarterbacks and a lot of exciting games. And so they tried to map it out so that there was one game each week that, at least one game, that would be available for a uh, ABC or Fox primetime matchup, right? right? But it turns out they got multiple games each week. And I'm looking at the second half of October where Washington, Oregon is, I think it's October 14th. And you start there and you can just go every Saturday 
there is there's one game after another that is going to be top 10 versus top 10 playoff implications you know easy candidate for for prime time broadcast i think it's just going to be a fantastic finish in terms of you know must see tv week after week You've covered the Pac-12 for a long time. Obviously, you've seen the the ups and downs and the roller coaster rides of this conference. But this year coming in, there was a lot of talk about quarterback play. And for good reason, there's been a lot of phenomenal quarterbacks. There's been a lot of fun that way. But now there's eight teams ranked in the top 25. You've got a lot of excitement, as we mentioned, with Colorado and different things that way. When you look at this, can you kind of put into perspective what this season means, even though it's probably the last season of the Pac-12? What, what does this season mean in perspective to all of the years that you've covered the Pac-12? Well, certainly it's the best season just for competition, a number of good teams since in at least a decade, right? Pac-12 had a pretty good run, like 20, 2014, 15, 16, multiple teams in the playoff, finished each year with you know five or six teams in the AP poll. Since then, it's kind of been a tough slog for the conference. So in, the, in that regard, it's, it's the best year for in at least a decade, but it, for quarterback play, I mean, I think you got to go back to, you know, there was one year where Troy Aikman and Rodney Pete, I fin- think finished second and third in the Heisman in the late eighties quarterback play is off the charts. Uh, the excitement is, is off the charts. And then you have the backdrop of, of collapse and extinction. Uh, and it is very pac 12 that it would finally have this incredible year when it really doesn't matter to the future of the conference, right? There were so many years where a season like this would have helped fortify the Pac-12 mm-hmm. for, for the long haul. Right. And instead, it can't execute until it's already broken. <laughs> and that is a very Pac-12, it's very Shakespearean, it's very Pac-12 thing to happen. And I just think you can't separate the the off-the-field backdrop from the on-the-field uh, events. It's its just kind of like uh, some kind of Hamlet playing out. John, you know, the Deion Sanders effect, you know, I think a lot of people, at least when he took over, right, with, you know, his, his personality and what he brings to the table, and then you look at the pretty radical roster turnover, people thought that they were going to be, you know, one win, two wins, you know, two and ten, three and nine, and here we are, right? They're three and oh, they're ranked in, in the top 20, they have two power five wins. What does Deion Sanders and Colorado sort of like add to the Pac-12 for what, as Josh alluded to, is essentially the final season of the conference? I mean, they're the biggest story in the whole country right now. Yeah. I mean, the TV ratings, I mean, everything is just incredible. I don't even think the, the, you know, mo- the rosiest outlook from a Colorado fan would have necessarily foreseen exactly what's happened. But I think part of the reason it's happened is because of the way they scheduled, right? They opened the season against the national runners up on right. a Fox big noon game. So that drew a whole lot of eyeballs and then they won and they keep, have kept winning. So the, the train just keeps picking up passengers. Uh, it is incredible. They have overshadowed USC, which has the reigning Heisman Trophy winner. They've overshadowed Washington, which is not lost in a, almost a year. They've overshadowed Oregon, which is always difficult to do. Uh, it has been incredible. It has just helped elevate the Pac-12 and the narrative and the attention to, uh, I mean, an unprecedented level. Even if Colorado, the Pac-12 was going to be uh, fascinating, even if Colorado had been mediocre, right? But the fact that they've started like this, it's just, they're overshadowing everything. It's incredible. Well, I think you've seen that with just random people that don't follow college football, right? I, I was talking to somebody that they were visiting an 85-year-old woman that um, they were taking some dinner to, and, and uh, you know, she's a big BYU fan, but she didn't even watch the BYU game because she wanted to watch Coach Prime, and she wanted to watch all that <laughs> stuff. You know, yeah. I mean, it's, right. it's incredible what these are, what's happening. People are tuning in to 60 Minutes to be able to watch Prime on, on there. I mean, do, do you feel like this is... This is good for the Pac-12, even if it is short-lived. Do you do you feel like it's sustainable? What where do you kind of land on this whole Coach Prime effect? Well, I mean, is it sustainable? I don't I don't think it is because I don't think he's long for Colorado, right? I mean, I I think he's got, you know, whether it's this year or in a couple of years, an SEC school. All the SEC schools that passed on him mm-hmm. are now, they, you know, they're going to make a run at him. 
I would not be surprised if the NFL makes a run at him. I mean, Arizona Cardinals, right, come to mind. Uh, I, I just, I just don't think he's going to be satisfied long term in Boulder, right? Uh, but certainly, he can keep it going as long as he's there, and it, it has certainly helped the Pac-12, right? I mean, it's helping Washington State and Oregon State as they scramble for survival because it's just bringing more attention to the conference as a whole. And people are going to watch a Washington State Oregon State game because of Deion Sanders because the, everybody's interested in the Pac-12, right? So it's like, uh, you know, he's a, he's a sports icon. It's kind of like if Magic Johnson decided he was going to coach UC Riverside for a couple of years, <laughs> and then he went and coached Utah basketball or, you know, uh, Arizona State basketball. That's, that is that you're adding this celebrity factor that the sport has really never seen, right? And that, I think that has just captured the attention of people who only know him because he's on the Aflac commercials with Nick Saban. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, we do want to turn the page to Utah UCLA, but before we do that, what does your gut tell you going into conference play again? What does your gut tell you on what the Pac-12 championship game matchup will be right now? Well, I have been, I picked the Huskies from the start. Uh, at, I have kind of gone back and forth on who I think is going to finish second, right? Uh, USC, uh, Utah, for a long time I thought it was going to be Utah. Now I'm not so sure. USC, Oregon, I've been impressed with Oregon, right? Uh, I I think any of those three teams, I don't know that Oregon State, Washington State, even UCLA have the depth, right? Because there's going to be so many tough games. There, There's – there's only a couple of, of Saturdays off, really. And if you if your schedule doesn't have Stanford or ASU, then you've got even a higher load of difficult games. Right. So who's got the depth to be able to win a tough game when you've got a long injury list and it's late October or November? Who's got the depth to win on a regular basis? And, you know, I Oregon, pro, Oregon and USC probably, uh, to me, would be the top challengers. To, to the Huskies at this point. So we, you know, I want to shift to, to UCLA a little bit. And, and obviously it, it's hard when we get into this type of this type of the year to understand the schedules and, and understand, you know, you know, the level of competition that each team has faced. UCLA yeah. has probably arguably, arguably had a, a much better schedule than Utah. How, what do you, what do you think about UCLA right now? Are they a good team? Are they a team that can compete for a Pac-12 championship or are they peaking right now and, and, probably will fall to the wayside as, as all these other teams kind of start playing them and, and, and everything else that way. Yeah, I don't know what to make of them because, uh, you know, they played Coastal Carolina, North Carolina Central, and San Diego State. And San Diego State is not very good this year. Yeah, uh, They've shown that each week that they this is not the San Diego State team that, you know, beat Utah, for instance. Um, so I, I think UCLA is probably the biggest mystery in the conference. Uh, they have looked good, but against uh, substandard competition, it's not necessarily their fault. Michigan canceled a home and home series, so they had to scramble to find a replacement. Uh, I I don't know. They, they ha- their freshman quarterback Dante Moore is big time. He can really throw the ball. You know that they are well have a well designed offense with Chip Kelly. I just don't, I don't know about their defense. It has been uh, wobbly for many years. I think going certainly going into Salt Lake City, first uh, first conference game for Moore, in arguably the toughest environment in the whole conference. Uh, I think that that's going to be the thing to watch. If if they don't have if they can control the ball, you know I think it's going to it should be a pretty good matchup. Uh, you know we certainly can get into what's who's playing quarterback for Utah because that's a, important. But but the Bruins are a little bit of an unknown, right? Just because of who they've played, so. I can't give you a great answer. Let's stick with Dante Moore for a second. You know, for months and months, we've been talking about the Pac-12 and the depth of the Pac-12 and specifically the depth of the, you know, the QB talent between, you know, Cam Rising and Bo Nix and and Caleb Williams and on down the list. You've got seven or eight programs with elite quarterback play. And Dante Moore comes in here as a true freshman. He's essentially, you know, the unquestioned starter now. As you've said, John, he can really throw the ball. From what you've seen, and it is limited still, does he strike you as potentially like the next great Pac-12 quarterback? 
Oh, I think so, for sure. Uh, if, you know, if you're going down, you know, down the list to ki- kids that have multiple years of eligibility left and aren't turning pro this uh, this spring, yeah, I think he is. You know, Jaden Rashad at ASU, uh, yeah. blue chip recruit, he's very talented as well. Uh, but but more, well, he threw a pass. Uh, I think it was a San Diego State game, just a, a lights out NFL pass on a on a deep out pattern, dropped it down perfect right right in the in the basket. Uh, and you you saw that and you're like, that's an NFL throw right there. And he is very poised. Uh, he's got mobility. He can buy himself time. But you know, this is a next level challenge for him. Go Rice Eccles has eaten up a lot of talented quarterbacks who have a lot more experience than he does yeah there's been a lot of freshman quarterbacks come into rice cycle stadium and, and fair <laughs> fair uh, well and fair yeah. terribly so it'll be an of, interesting of veterans <laughs> too <laughs> this is true this is true we'll, we'll get you out on this final question i know you're a busy guy so um you've talked about utah has kind of just played the under you know they're underrated they're they're not the, the team that everybody's focused on or looking at even though they are ranked 11th in the country but for you, if Utah goes in and wins this game, you know, they, they continue that streak at Rice Cycle Stadium where they, you know, they, they haven't lost and uh, they get their first win in conference play. What do you think 4-0 means to Utah at this point in the season? I mean, I think 3-0 means a lot because if you had asked a lot of Utah fans before the season, okay, rising's out for the whole non-conference lineup and you're still going to be 3-0, everybody would have loved it. Mm-hmm. You know, and I know there's, they, I've seen on Twitter that or X that, you know, fans are a little bit, uh, they're down on Nate Johnson. It's like, boy, talk about <laughs> changing expectations, right? Yeah. I mean, they're treating, they're evaluating Nate Johnson the way they used to evaluate Utah starters six or eight years ago. <laughs> and now, now they're poking holes in the back of it's like holy smokes remember where you've been folks um but so four and oh would be great but the thing is then what happens then you got to go to corvallis and that game's on a friday isn't it yeah yeah i mean they had a they got run over two years ago there oregon state's better probably than they were two years ago but that is you know that's what utah is going to face that's what all the top teams are going to face it's going to be one game after another of of matchups that have huge implications and what i wonder about with with utah is you know every season if you're going to contend or win the title right every season comes down to like five or six crucial plays Mm -hmm. and for utah for all they've been through off the field the last couple years most if not all of those plays have gone the right way and some of those are just blind luck and so i wonder if everything is going to work for them on the margins for a third consecutive year. I mean, that's asking a lot and we haven't seen it. Nobody's won the Pac-12 three years in a row. So I just, that's where I wonder if they, they could be, you know, 99% of what they've been and finish two games out, Mm -hmm. three games out, just because a couple of key plays go, go against them. That's to me, that's the big question. It'll be a wild year. I'm, I'm excited to see conference play uh, kick off. I think there's a, a new energy that comes when all these teams start facing off, and it's oh, yeah. it's not USC versus Stanford. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> or Sacramento State versus Stanford. Yeah, that's yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it's going to be great. I mean, you know, like college football gets when the SEC has six or eight ranked teams and a bunch of schools in the top ten, and they got one big time matchup after another on CBS each mm-hmm. week. Everybody gets gets into that, and now the Pac-12 is finally having its turn. It's like you know the last the last chapter is is the best chapter. Yeah. It's a storybook ending in a terrible tragedy. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, thanks, John. Tell tell everybody where the they can find you if they don't already know. Well, certainly KSL, right? Uh, first and foremost, uh, appreciate the relationship we have with you guys and uh, Pac-12Hotline.com is uh is where we're found kenzano wilner podcast which is weekly most of the year twice a week during the season so we can embarrass ourselves with our picks against the spread uh (laughs) each week but i appreciate you guys having me on and all the support and i hope wish you both well the rest of the the rest of the season because it's going to be wild it will thanks john thank you so much a lot guys
That's awesome. It's always great to have uh, yeah. John come on, and uh, he's obviously a pro at, at what he does. He's he's uh, had a lot of years' experience in in being able to report on the Pac-12, and has has seen it from the very beginning, and essentially, and uh, seeing where it is today. And um, it's it's been a wild ride, right? I think you know, starting this week, you're you're getting a lot of top twenty-five teams playing each other, including in the Pac-12. You get Utah playing UCLA, Oregon State playing Washington State. Um, you know, you get you know, Colorado and Oregon. I mean, these, these are fun matchups that are on primetime TV, network TV that are going to be phenomenal games. And so it's exciting to see how this plays out. John's obviously a great voice there with that. So, um, yeah, I'm excited to see how it plays out. Any, anything crazy that he said to you? Uh, no, no, he's usually pretty even killed with his stuff. I mean, I, I am with him that I picked Washington to win the league back in, uh, July Mm -hmm. and, you know, through through three three four weeks watching the league early here i think washington has looked like the most complete team uh you know caliber of opponent has not been what utah has faced but you look at michael Penix and the wide receivers and washington's defensive front is a wagon and they've got guys on the back end as we're sitting here now you know with pac-12 play again getting ready to begin in earnest Washington looks like the most complete team. I think the jury's a little bit out on USC for now. Sure. Uh, Oregon has looked good, right? They, you know, they showed a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of moxie and and fortitude to win at Texas Tech. Um, and yeah, Utah's kind of in that, you know, that three four spot. You know, certainly can't count out Utah. But uh, as we're going to get into here, as we keep talking, I, I just don't know how to judge Utah quite yet based on the number of injuries and the guys who have not played yet. Yeah. And that's, and that's the tough thing. I wrote an article earlier this week about that, right. Is Utah's uh, been, you know, not as effective on offense as, as a lot of the fans want. Um, it's, it also is by design um, and to some extent, right? Like, I don't want to say this is all by design that Utah's trying to play it, you know, vanilla. I think they were trying to find a quarterback that could stick. Nate Johnson finally got there and, and everything, and we can we can talk more about that and all that. But I think it, it, you know at some point you do have to judge the team based on what they have right now, right? You know, if if Nate Johnson is the guy, you have to judge him based on that. So I, I I'm excited to see this week just to see what you know Andy Ludwig schemes up, what they do. You know, if Cam's not available, is it Nate Johnson? You know, well I, if Cam's not available, it will be Nate Johnson. But what does yeah. he do? How does the offense move along? There's been moments where you see them. You know, can they can move with ease and, and everything looks good. It seems like when they try to just play it cute or, or vanilla that things get a little bit wonky and, and allows the teams to to, to, to to beat them, essentially. So um, that'll be interesting. But I want to jump right into this because it's the only question that everybody has. Is Cam Rising finally playing on Saturday? Go. Oh, me? Okay. <laughs> um, no, uh, it, is, uh, it is Wednesday morning as we sit here and record this. As of now, I think we are heading towards rising starting against UCLA. Not in stone, mm-hmm. but talk to a few people behind the scenes and you're, you know, you're gauging. I think we're heading towards rising starting against UCLA. So let's stick there for a minute. Let's say that rising does start against UCLA. Presumably, you are getting a healthy. 100% rising because that has been the plan all along. Exactly. With the, between the Utah medical team and Dr. Neil Elitrash, his orthopedic surgeon in Los Angeles, they have been coming together and, 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 and working with rising to make sure that there are no limitations and that he is ready to go at full bore when he returns. Now, uh, one point to make here, when I say 100%, we need to kind of, put that into relative terms because he is coming back from knee surgery and rehab and he has not played a football game in almost nine months and he hasn't been hit in almost nine months. So my question to you is uh, yes, 100% rising potentially on the field at UCLA, but does 100% have to be a relative term and should people be maybe tempering what they expect to see out of rising if he does play Saturday. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think 100% is <laughs> is kind of a misnomer in in a lot of ways because it's it 
it indicates that he's available. It doesn't mean that he's physically 100%. And you can look at that uh, when his shoulder was there, right? Like he was technically 100% and was cleared to play. But you could tell that he still didn't have full mobility. He didn't have everything that he needed to to reach the depths of his throwing motions. And so it, it, it took some time, right? And then last year, he hurts his knee. Um, it, you know, it was an undisclosed injury, but it, it happened in the middle of the season. He obviously didn't play Washington State. That hampered him for the rest of the season. But by definition, he was 100% because he was on the field. He was ready to go. So right. I think, you, you, like you mentioned, you do have to temper these expectations to say, you know, Cam is ready to play. He's out there physically on the field. I don't think anybody in the Utah training staff or Cam in himself feels like he can't compete. It's just a matter of what what are we going to see that's a difference, right? I you know, you're still going to see Nate Johnson if Cam Rising plays because there's going to be yes. specific packages that allow him to be able to do something that Cam can't do. And that and that still may mean he's in there to throw the ball, but I think you're going to see a, a system where Utah is still trying to get Cam involved, but but allowing Nate to grow and continue well kind of piecemealing some of their offense because it's just not it's not going to happen the way that it has been the last few years. It's, you know, Cam, Cam is just not to the level yet where he can go that way. I think one kind of telltale sign of like, what is rising's real health? And again, we're talking sort of in hypotheticals, assuming that he plays against UCLA. One telltale sign of, of what his health level is will be how many design runs does Ludwig call for, rising because last year pre-injury that was in the first usc game when he banged up his knee Mm -hmm. and he essentially played hurt the rest of the year before that kyle whittingham had said a number of times that you know between he and andy they were comfortable with rising you know running like eight ten twelve times a game that's between scrambling out of the pocket and design runs and i think after he hurt his knee last year as you said, he missed Washington State, but then in the one or two games after that, I thought there was a noticeable drop in designed runs for rising. And there were some more in the Pac-12 championship game against against USC. I thought he looked, you know, reasonably healthy there. But just but just keep that in mind. Like to me, that's a telltale sign. Like if rising is out there, if they are not calling too many designed runs, I think that's a sign of essentially what his what his health level is. I'm going to paint a picture for you. All of a sudden, Rise Seckles is loud. They're ready to go. Bad Moon Rising comes out. That place goes electric. Everybody's there. And the first play is a designed run for Cam right up the middle. <laughs> that, that place is like, going to sure. like lose it. Right? <laughs> like, sure, we can like cut that. We can cut this part immediately if the first call is a design keeper. And sure, you know what? First and 10, take it for 12 yards. We all look stupid. Oh, I Done. wanted to go for a touchdown. Let's just go okay. full way, man. <laughs> like, like, just unhitch the wagon and just go. I love it. Nah, that's I love it. Good. If it does happen. I mean, they took a 70-yard shot against Florida, so I'm not going to rule it out at this point. No, but, no. Uh, no, it'll be interesting. I, Like you mentioned, like, I... Cam, Cam is going to be uh, – I've heard the same things in essence, you know, where he, he's coming. And last week I said 70-30 that he could play in, in Weber State. That was yeah. based on confidence. I'm not going to give a prediction this this week. Too many people got pissed off at that. And um, and I understand it. I, I You know, whatever. Uh, but I, I do think it is trending this way. Utah hasn't been holding him out just to play him for UCLA. It's a legitimate thing where they are honestly back to their, their backs are against their wall. They're trying to get him available, cleared from his doctor. He, he travels out to California every once in a while to get clearance. My understanding, and this could be wrong, he is going out there this Thursday to be able to get the clearance. Um, whether it's cleared in person or whether it's cleared over Zoom or whatever it may be, it doesn't really matter. If they clear him, they clear him, and he's ready to go. I think they're getting that way. You know, He was on the field late yesterday practicing with some players, trying to do some things. I think he's gearing up to go. Um, that still doesn't mean that he's going to be there hundred percent, but I think it's, it's starting to get there. So I think it'll be an interesting thing. You know, we're not going to find out. Kyle essentially said it's 48 hours that they're going to know from yesterday. Um, they really are waiting for clearance. Uh, this, you know, this is going to come down to the wire, but they have Nate Johnson. And I, you know, I, I kind of want to see your take on the evolution of Nate Johnson. Do you think he's made the necessary, se- necessary steps to be able to lead Utah to a win against UCLA? Against UCLA, yes. I think Utah can win a football game with what Nate Johnson has has shown you. Um, I wasn't around over the weekend, and I wasn't around Monday. I, 
I was doing the family thing, uh, but I did I did do my best to get caught up on everything yesterday. Uh, the fact that Kyle Whittingham in his Monday presser said, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, that they they are giving Nate Johnson essentially half the playbook versus what they would give Rising, which mm-hmm. means you're not comfortable giving this still inexperienced redshirt freshman the full reins to the offense. It's a lot, okay? And Rising has been in the program for five years. So you feel comfortable giving rising everything. Nate Johnson is a little green and a little inexperienced. So you don't want to overload him with too much. You're giving him what you believe he can handle. And I understand that a lot of fans, at least the ones that I deal with in my DMS and mentions or whatever, that kind of soundbite from, from, uh, from Kyle Whittingham was taken poorly. And, you know, it's a sense of like, well, this, you know, Nate Johnson's not cam rising and why can't they open up the playbook and why can't they go deep? Like if they could, they would, wouldn't you. And again, I'm like, I'm not telling anybody how to fan here. I know people get mad at me, but would, if you're playing Nate Johnson, okay, this is where we are rising, not available. Nate Johnson in there. If you are playing Nate Johnson, wouldn't you want to give him enough where he's comfortable exactly. and not, and not overwhelmed. You don't want to overwhelm this kid with too much. Okay. Again, that was his, that was his first career start, right? Yeah. First it, career it was, start. It was. Don't overwhelm this kid. Give him what he can handle. And that's fine. I thought I I watched the replay again. Wasn't in town. I watched the replay. Kid played pretty good. I thought he got away with, you know, Weaver should have had probably one, maybe two interceptions. A better team maybe picks those off, but fine. I thought for his first career start at home, I really don't have a ton of complaints about Nate Johnson. Now, as I've said for a number of weeks here, if you're going to be playing Nate Johnson or Bryson Barnes versus Florida, you need to be getting something from your rushing attack. And they did. Okay. And again, back to the play calling and what you're giving Nate Johnson, Utah went to the run 72% of the time against Weber. Mm -hmm. You're not trying to overload the redshirt freshman quarterback. There's really not a lot to complain about if you take a step back and consider what Nate Johnson is. And again, you don't want to overwhelm him. They gave him what he could handle. And I really, like objectively, not, not a ton to complain about in that game about Nate Johnson. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it was a perfect environment for a you know redshirt freshman who this is his first start to be able to get thrown into the wolves, right, so to speak. Yes, he's had certain plays, and he's understand that, but it's, it's different when you have a designed run off the edge or something like that. You know that's what it's going to be. You don't have to be too cerebral and see where that, that play is going to you know break down and everything that way. I'm not saying he isn't. Um, I'm just saying he hasn't had to do that as much until last Saturday. Now, this is going to be a different look. UCLA is going to try to confuse him just like UT, Utah's defense is going to try to confuse Dante more. The, the the difference with freshman quarterbacks, it's not that they're not talented. It's just it's coming at them so fast. You know, I talked to Lander Barton yesterday, and I asked him, like, are you more comfortable? And he's like, just the speed alone, that it makes it so much easier. And he's a dude that just literally has to go find a guy and tackle him, right? Like, it right. takes time to be able to to get up to the speed from high school to college, and then even from college to the NFL for those guys, it's a drastic difference. It it takes time for people to recognize that, to kind of get up to it. You know, Nate has to do this better than anybody because he has to process so many things. And so, you know, I understand the fans that have have been frustrated by that comment of Whittingham. I I personally took it as, uh, you know, a great thing for Nate that they're giving him half the playbook, they trust him, and they're giving him more confidence, or he's giving them more confidence that they've been able to open it up a little bit, right? They feel like they can do some things. They're not going to go the full playbook that Andy Ludwig has, which is 90 pages long, maybe literally. Um, this yeah. is this is something where they, they want to put Nate in a, in a situation where he, he can succeed as a freshman quarterback. And so it's going to take some time, right? There's going to come a time if Cam's not playing and Nate's there, he's going to throw an interception, right? Cam throws interceptions. Let's not forget that, right? Like he's, he's good and he hasn't been too bad in, in what he's been able to do. But these are humans, right? They're out there. They're trying to process information. The defense's literal job is to confuse them and make them turn the ball over or get in a situation that doesn't work. So I think based on what you saw last week, that's incredible progress from Nate. I think you're seeing a lot of great things from him. He's processing it well. He's owning it up, more importantly, with his teammates where he's taking that veteran leadership. He's coming in there and he's helping them. Um, you know, and that, that leads to a question that you got this week in the mailbag. Is he QB1 next year once this is all done? 
Yeah, you know, John Wilner, who we just had on, uh, he 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 was more firm mm-hmm. than you know than me. He, you know, John John's thing was John's thing was that Nate Johnson is now in line for QB one. And maybe that's true, but Nate Johnson's resume as a quarterback is <laughs> the fourth quarter at Baylor <laughs> and Saturday against an FCS team. He has not done enough yet to like you are QB one in 2024. No. Um, what I essentially said in the mailbag was I, I think, you know, once you get past this season, this is rising's team, whenever rising's back, this is his team. But if you're looking ahead to spring, I don't, maybe you don't have a full blown open quarterback competition, but if you're going to open it up some Nate Johnson certainly has a leg up now because he's got real game experience. He'll continue to get real game experience. And when you look at the rest of the room, uh, projecting it, Nate Johnson, Brandon Rose, who still has not taken a collegiate snap, Mac Howard, who has not taken a collegiate snap. You may still have Bryson Barnes in the room. He's got more eligibility. Uh, who knows what Isaac Wilson's health will be. And then, you know, you look at the room. Yeah, Nate Johnson has a leg up if this thing is open in the spring. And I've been a loud proponent of if you feel the need to go to the transfer portal. Yeah. The, you know, the fact that Charlie Brewer didn't work out and um, and Jake Bentley, that was a, a mess after Cam Rising got hurt in 2020. Jaquindon Jackson, to a lesser extent, right? He was brought in here as a quarterback. It wasn't working out. He's now a running back. The, the staff should not be afraid to go to the portal if you don't think you have the guy in the room. If you think you have the guy in the room, if you think it's Nate Johnson, yes, go ahead and dump reps into Johnson you know, knowing that he's the guy, but if you don't think you have the guy, don't be afraid to go to the portal. You know, the stuff with Bentley and Brewer, and again, to a lesser extent, you Quinton Jackson, that has nothing to do with what you think you might have to do going into 24. Well, and that's just the nature of the quarterback position anymore, right? Like you look at a team like Ole Miss, they have Jackson Dart, who everybody's assumed was a great player. You know, he was the starter, did well for them, you know, he went in and, and got more quarterbacks. He, I'm trying to remember his name for the Oklahoma State quarterback, um, brought him in to push him, right? Like, I don't think there's a situation here where that doesn't help Utah. You're trying to get guys no matter what. If, let's say, let's say Nate Johnson or Brandon Rose or any of those other quarterbacks don't work out, you at least have somebody with some experience. Now, that's hard because no veteran is going to come into a system that they're not guaranteed to play. It would be tough. The, 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 they're at least con- competing for it, right? And that doesn't yes. mean that they can't can't get beat out and you know Nate Johnson is that guy but I think there has to be a quarterback competition next year and you know it's it's funny that we're talking about it right now but I think that's just the nature of where Nate Johnson is you know unless yeah. unless for whatever reason Cam is just not healthy or something happens and Nate leads the team all the way through and you know does remarkably well I still think there's a quarterback competition next year like I said unless Nate just absolutely kills it this year right they're, they would be doing themselves a disservice if they weren't doing that. And it doesn't have to be a long-lived one. It could be in spring where it takes one week and Kyle Whittingham names him the starting quarterback. I don't know that we'll get that from Kyle. He likes to drag it out a little bit. Um, he likes to add the drama without really adding the drama. So It'll be like August 23rd, and we're still asking <laughs> questions about the starter. Let's get real. Nate's been the starting quarterback for like two years, and it's still like, I don't know. No, I mean, that, that's the thing. When, when Kyle finds his guy that he absolutely believes in, and that's been Cam Rising, once he finds him, he, he's, you know, unabashedly going toe-to-toe yeah. with anybody about that, right? Like, he will prop up his guy better than anybody that you've ever seen. So I think it's just more Nate's just got to give them more confidence, and that's just the nature of, of, the, the, of the position. Yeah. And so um, it'll be interesting to see how it goes. But, look, this quarterback controversy, or if that's what you want to call it, is, is not going to go away. Uh, we're going to be talking about this forever. But with that, let's kind of go back to the offense uh, in general. So the first three games, it really hasn't been anything electric. You had a 70-yard touchdown pass from Bryson Barnes. That was obviously the big play. You know, in Baylor, Nate Johnson leads them in the second half, the fourth quarter essentially, uh, you know, had some good moments and, and got them there. So it looks like they've been there. Even in Weber State, there was a couple drives where it was like, okay, this is a well-oiled machine. Everything's going well. Yeah. But outside of that, they've kind of been a lull of, of offense. Do you think this is conservative play calling on offense, or is it just Utah trying to figure out what's going on in their system? Could be a little bit of both. Um, I, think the, I think the second half against Florida – like when the defense was like really locked in and it was clear that, you know, it, it was clear that Graham Mertz was not going to have enough to overcome Utah's defense. 
I don't I don't think Andy Ludwig went like deep into the bag no. like against Florida because you didn't have to. And then Baylor, you tried to do some things, but Bryson Barnes just wasn't effective, right? He was he was sailing balls, he was laid on balls. That just wasn't happening. Now take those two things and then you know, Weber, I agree with you, right? There were a, a, a few drives there where it looked like a well-oiled machine. But remember, Andy Ludwig has not been going deep into the bag and he's not giving the full playbook. And I'm sure, look, Bryson Barnes has a ton of experience operating Andy Ludwig's offense, but Bryson Barnes is not Cam Rising. Exactly. So I really don't think that Bryson Barnes was getting the full playbook either. They were giving him what he could, what he could operate under, which is probably not the whole thing. So, is a conservative play calling on offense? Probably yes, which is a little bit by design. Remember, you don't you don't have a pass catching tight end. You don't have Brand Keithy out there. Uh, Thomas Yasmin has has not taken in terms of like a, a like a monster play catching guy who who you can target ten times like Keithy. That's not who Thomas Yasmin is. That's not what he's looked like through three games. So that's something else to consider. And Makai Bernard is out for the season. That's a guy that you could, you know, throw to out in the flat and let and let him, you know, go for 12, 14, 16 yards after the catch. So the play calling is conservative. Mm-hmm. But I think that's out of necessity because of who who's out but also who's in specifically a quarterback. And again, you can judge this all you want. Yeah, I agree. It's conservative. And somebody told me on Twitter, like it's not a fun brand of football. Great. <laughs> they're they're three and oh, and the defense is a wagon, but okay, fine. It's not a fun brand of football, but like they're surviving and they're surviving. They're, they're trying to survive until guys are ready, specifically rising. When rising comes back, you may see things be a little more diverse, but even when Rising's back, you still need the guys around him to start making plays. Devon Bailey's been pretty quiet. Yeah. And you can blame that on on Barnes against Baylor, against sailing balls, holding on to it for too long. Like the wide receiver position has not really produced. Mm-hmm. That could be another reason why the play calling is conservative because guys are not producing. But bottom line, I'm rambling here. Yes, the play calling has been conservative. But I think that is mostly out of necessity right now. Yeah, and I, I would agree with that. And I'd also argue that, you know, Barnes probably had a little bit bigger of a playbook that he could use. He just couldn't make those plays. You did see that in Baylor. He was he he was targeting guys. He just was completely selling the ball sure. over or yeah. holding on to the ball too long. So it's not that Andy is just completely given up and he's saying, you know, we're gonna go conservative, <laughs> ground and pound, and we're just gonna go that way. I mean, it, it can work and Utah should be able to do that with their running backs, but you know, it's it's been somewhat by design and somewhat out of just necessity, just based on quarterback play, trying to find the guy. But also, you have to look at the offensive line slash tight end room. They're they're not getting exactly the same type of push that that they need yet. They're 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 trying to protect, right? They're trying to find things and not blow assignments. Tight ends, you know, you got for example, and I'm not I don't want to single him out just because of this, but Miki Sugarutaga, he's a brand new guy on the tight end, in the tight end room. You know, it's going to take some time for him to get those live reps and understand who am I blocking and where is it going to go. You know, that's partially why Nate Johnson is so good because you can roll him out of the pocket and escape. So yes, it it ha- you know it, it does it doesn't look like fun football. I get that, right? Like sitting up there, you, Weber State, those are hard games anyway. FCS opponents, they should be able to dominate them, but it's it just wasn't fun football because you're holding stuff back and you're also trying to get these things to work. So. Look, it. I. I don't think you're going to see that same system this week. You know, I think it's still not going to be what you see at the end of the season, where Utah probably opens up the playbook more. I think they're still going to kind of dial it mm-hmm. in, especially even if Cam's there. Cam has the full playbook. Understand, he understands it all, right? But I don't think you're going to just completely open up the playbook against UCLA because you can, no. right? So, look. Have patience. I know this is the same crowd that wants, um, you know, Andy Ludwig fired because he's conservative and he just does the same thing. Jim Harding fired because the offensive line can't protect. So Kyle Whittingham should be fired as well because clearly he's a terrible coach and can't get anything done. So, you know, I mean, it's it's just funny. Like, and I, I kid, right? But um, it's it's just... 
like take it take it easy, right? Like I understand being a fan is hard, is hard, and yep. you know you want things to go well. You saw your team averaging, I think it was thirty eight point six points last year. Like yeah, that was a fun offense, and whenever Cam had the ball, you felt like he could score at will. That's not where this team is right now, but you're still three and zero. If anything, you're better than last year based on record alone. So, you know, you've got a lot of time. Have some fun with it. It's going to be okay. Take a deep breath. Deep breath. I watched Aaron Rodgers Achilles blow up <laughs> after oh, a summer's there. worth we're there. of oh. a summer's worth of hype. Okay, <laughs> if I can survive that, I'm here for you people recording this podcast. If I can survive that, four snaps. You people can survive what's going on now with Utah football. All right. Four snaps. <laughs> Four snaps. Three dropbacks, pressure on all of them. I don't want to talk about Hey, how they do events, the Cowboys. I'm curious. Good talk, Josh. Good talk. <laughs> and that ends our <laughs> podcast. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, well, let's let's jump a little bit to the UCLA game. Uh, I don't think we need to talk a ton about it, but last year, this game at the Rose Bowl, you know, Utah, for the most part, at least initially, went kind of toe-to-toe. It was not a great showing for Utah, and then they just completely let it go. There was a late hit call on the sidelines that really kind of turned the tide of the game. Kyle still yeah. brings it up to this day. Um, it's yep. just not something that he was very happy about. Then UCLA just went to work. DTR absolutely diced Utah up. Jake Bobo, tight end, he he was phenomenal for them, was getting behind their their DBs every single time. It just was not a great game. The defense, this, this game is very similar to that Florida game where Utah just felt like this was completely terrible. It's not yeah. who they are on defense. But for you, do you view this as a retribution game for Utah? I know it's one game in conference play, but is this retribution game? Uh, interesting question. I mean, on paper, maybe, but like each, each game is its own separate entity. And, you know, look, DTR is no longer is no longer at UCLA and Jake Bobo is no longer there. You know, uh, Clark Phillips, who, you know, had the late pick six and that he's no longer there. So now I, I would, I wouldn't paint this as a, as a retribution game, but I think that defensive effort last year for the guys that were there is, you know, probably hanging over, hanging over the program this week and hanging over things. Uh, you know, look, the, that was one of those games where it got, it sort of got away early and you could tell that Utah's defense was not up to snuff early, but you know, they kind of woke up and they had the momentum. I think they were, I think it was a one score game when Kareni Reed hit DTR yep. out of bounds. That was like a third and forever and, you know, and DTR scrambled and got out of bounds. Kareni Reed hit him. Momentum shifted. Uh, I don't. Re- I wish I'd looked it up. I, I don't think Cam Rising had his cleanest game. I, I do remember there was one horrendous pick late in the first half that I'm sure he would like back. So um, retribution game, no, but it, it is something that I'd be bringing up to the veteran guys because that's certainly um, that certainly shifted the you know the tenor of the season there momentarily. Obviously, they saved the season essentially by beating USC the following week. Uh, and, and again, just to just to kind of go back to something John Wilner said, like every not every game, but there's a lot of games for Utah where it sort of feels like the Super Bowl. And if you want to go back to the Pac-12 championship game, there are certain things that you have to do. You don't want to start 0-1, obviously in Pac-12 play, and you don't want the home winning streak to end. So, you know, every game, if you want to go back to Vegas and you want a chance at the New Year's Six, every game is critical. But this one feels, you know, again, this one feels a little more critical than your average game just because we don't know who the quarterback is. Again, we're sort of assuming that Rising's ramp up process is done or or nearing its end and 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 he will play in this game, but there's a lot at stake, you know. Um if you want to defend your Pac-12 title, you know, you have to show up every week, but this one as the opener feels especially critical to me. Yeah, and I think Utah has moved past it as a program of of calling retribution games, right? I mean, barring like the Florida game which just they felt like it was different and it's against an SDC, SEC opponent. You know, that had a little bit more of a retribution game feel. This one, it just feels like Utah's going about its business doing it. I mean, I talked to a few players that they they did bring it up, right? Like, they did talk about this being a game that they want simply because of how they played last year. But this isn't their driving factor, right? It's not like, oh, we have to beat UCLA because they got us last time. They're not a mid-major program anymore and trying to, like, come up or, I guess, group of five. That's basketball terminology, whatever. You see what I'm saying. They're they're, they're not a group of five team anymore trying to get one, you know, against the, the tough team. 
This is a team that is a two-time defending champions. You know, they did everything they needed to to get there. Now, like you mentioned, it's it's starting conference season 1-0, and more importantly, doing that against a conference opponent that is going to compete for a conference title. You've got to win these games. And, and it's tough because that's essentially every game this year for Utah because they mm-hmm. are playing – Almost all of the eight teams ranked in the power uh, the pack or in the AP top twenty five. I can use my words today, I promise. You know this. This is one of those where you know losing to Arizona isn't going to hurt as much as losing to UCLA. You've got to be able to get these, and so yes. I think that's their focus more than anything is just being able to keep that in check, making sure that they're worried about that kind of stuff. So, look, retribution or not, I don't think it matters. I think you know Utah wants to be able to improve their defense, and they have. This is a much better defense, so. Uh, I'm not too worried about it. So, you get my uh, you get my question every week. You ready for I it? I do. Okay. I'm, oh yeah, how I'm does, ready for it this time. How does Utah lose this game? The defense again has looked excellent. Um, Eleven points against Florida, thirteen points against Baylor, seven against Weber State. The defense is yielding like ten points, seven points per game by any metric. The defense has been really, really good to start the year. One thing that is sort of noticeable. Uh, especially in the Baylor game, the the defense is giving up huge chunk plays through the air. Uh, something like five or six passes of like 35 or 40 yards or more uh, given up by the defense. Um, if you let Dante Moore get comfortable and you let Dante Moore succeed through the air and UCLA is moving the ball through the air, that's a recipe for a loss. If you let Dante Moore just sit there and air it out and they're completing passes for 30, 35 yards, getting into the gray zone, getting into the red zone, getting points at, uh, at point blank range, don't let Dante Moore get comfortable. Because again, as John Wilner said, this kid has NFL level stuff already. He can really throw the ball. And yes, UCLA's um, opposition, you know, they haven't played top tier opponents, but this is what we have to go on. Dante Moore has looked really good. If you let Dante Moore get comfortable, if you let him complete huge chunk plays, that's a recipe for a home upset, I think. Yeah, and I I agree with that. And I think, you know, the one area that gives me pause on this defense is that secondary at times, not necessarily safeties, but at corner. Um, There's been a few times where they've been beat. They haven't played the the ball the right way and, and, you know, allows their their receiver to be able to get the ball. So I agree with you on that. I I do think Utah will scheme it in a way that will try to confuse Dante more and and try to get him into a situation where it looks like it's a man-to-man coverage and then instantly it's, you know, bracketed coverage or something that way. I I will say, you know, to go a little bit different, I will say whoever controls the run game will win this game, and that's on offense and defense, right? I think if, let's say, for example, Utah can get a good run game going, I think that bodes well for them. Um, But if they can't stop it on the other end, I don't think that helps because this UCLA team can run. You know, they don't have Zach Charbonnet back there anymore, but they still got Mm -hmm. dudes that can do it. And so I think that's really where this is going to happen. And so it's essentially trench play. If the trench play can be effective for Utah, I think they're fine in this game. I think they can do what they need to. You're going to be able to get some passes. You know, it's, it may be a gritty rock fight type of a game that, you know, probably many aren't expecting, but I think trench play is going to be the most important area. And that's where this game is won or lost. You know, a rock fight. Um, again, nobody should be complaining about a rock fight. And I understand, like, you want to see a, you know, a fun offense that's scoring points and pe- like it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, especially if Rising can't go. Yeah, you you will take. I promise you, everybody, <laughs> you will take a seventeen thirteen win and go to Corvallis on Friday night. I promise it's going to be okay. The thing is like even if it is 17 to 13, like you played a top 25 team, you're adding to your <laughs> resume like just take it, right? Like Georgia went out there and looked like crap in the week 3 and like they're still the number 1 team, right? Like W. It doesn't fine. matter. Like and and I get it. Like there's there's outside stuff and as a fan you want things to work and you've heard sure. about this and everything's been great. But, like, at the end of the day, all that honestly matters is winning. And so, like, whatever happens between those 60 minutes from when it starts to end, it's fine. Just breathe. We're going to start gonna this. Fine. We're going to do promise. yoga. Should we start doing yoga at the end of this? I Breathing used techniques. to do yoga. I should get back into it. I was feeling much better when I was doing yoga. Okay, we're going to do downward dog, child's pose, you know, do some <laughs> breathing techniques. You know, we can, we can do this. Maybe this is actually, you know what, this podcast is now a yoga podcast, so... We are multi-talented. We can we, we can be diverse. We can talk about a number of things. It opens up a new subscription model for us too. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> Love it. All right. Well, uh, thanks you. For, thank you for listening to uh, another episode of the Utah Checkdown Podcast. Uh, we appreciate all the people that listen and subscribe. Um, if you haven't already, go do so. You know, tell your friends, tell your family, uh, but also talk to us on social media. Tell us what you want us to talk about. It helps us understand what we what the yep. sentiment of the fans are. So it's very helpful that way. But for the Utah Checkdown Podcast, we're signing off today. That's Josh and Josh. We're not going to go with that. Are we going to go with that? Josh and Josh? No. Okay. Laters. Later. Later.